Yeah. I'm off now. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye, Pete. Good luck, okay? Good Thank luck. You. Um, so, growing up in the town of Deal in Middle Street, I was always very aware that in years past, the town had a really serious problem with smuggling, um, particularly in the 18th century. So much so that an army was sent into Deal on several occasions to deal with the problem with smuggling. And this only ever happened in the town of Deal. Okay? Now, if you look at the landscape of Kent, it has a lot to offer the enterprising smuggler. We have flat shingle beaches in this area that are ideal for landing boats in the dead of night and unloading contraband onto the beaches. Then we have flat countryside across Kent, um, all the way to the city of London, where merchants and markets waited to sell on those smuggled goods. And of course, it's only a few dozen miles across the English Channel to the continent. So it's of no surprise that we would eventually have a problem um, with smuggling in the town of Deal. Also, the town of Deal has a nautical past. Um, lots of people from Deal operated as pilots for Admiral Nelson. So they were very talented seafaring men um, who eventually turned their hand to smuggling. <laughs> Now, when we think of smugglers, we often think of um, lovable rogues, uh, Robin Hood-type figures that evaded tax and helped the poor. And this is the direct result of writers like Russell Thorndike, who you may have um, grown up reading or watching uh, Dr. Sin, the Scarecrow of Romney Marsh. Um, writers tend to romanticise the idea of smuggling. I'm very guilty of it myself. Um, in actual fact, smugglers were hardened criminals and murderers. And often the truth is much more violent um, than the fiction surrounding the smuggling industry. So smuggling, it began all the way back in the 13th century. Back in those days, people weren't smuggling contraband into the country. They were actually smuggling contraband out of the country. And that contraband was wool. Um, back in those days, um, we had an absolute abundance of sheep all the way across the county of Kent. Um, if you look at lots of modern place names, they have their origins in the wool trade. For example, the Isle of Sheppey takes its name simply from Sheep Island. Now, over, back in those days, the most talented weavers in the entire world were the Huguenots that were based over in France. And wool smugglers in the 13th century, they were known as owlers. This is partly because, like owls, they were nocturnal. Um, their activities um, were carried out in the dead of night. But it's also, and I think this idea is very sweet, um, they would communicate with each other using the two two owl signal. <laughs> this is a really nice sort of romantic thought, isn't it? <laughs> now, for hundreds of years, um, owlers continued to smuggle wool, and it posed absolutely no problem. However, eventually, smuggling wool started to affect the wool trade in this country. So laws were put into place to try and wipe out um, the smuggling of wool along the Kent coast. Eventually, in the 16th century, um, a king of England was on the throne, King Henry VIII, um, and he had problems with the French and the Spanish. Okay? Um, and he created his own church, the Church of England. Okay? And by creating the Church of England, he seriously affected the smuggling industry because the Protestant weavers over in France were Protestant. And of course, France was a Catholic country. Henry VIII created a country that welcomed Protestants. So when it became very dangerous for Protestants to live in France, they were being persecuted um, for their religion and killed um, in the St. Bartholomew's Massacre in Paris, large numbers began fleeing to England, fleeing the religious persecution. Of course, because they were very, very talented, we welcomed them with opened arms. So they settled in Canterbury. They founded the weaving industry there. Within 20 years, 
the weaving industry employed roughly one third of Canterbury's population. Now, in the middle of the 16th century, the population of Canterbury was around 12,000, so approximately 4,000 people were employed in the weaving industry. There were around 2,000 weaving looms in operation at any one time. Of course, large numbers of weavers also settled in other towns like Sandwich. Now, what this meant for smugglers is that suddenly there was no need to smuggle wool across the English Channel. That wool could be worked on right here, just along the road in Sandwich. So smugglers <coughs> turned their minds to other cargoes, um, such as lace, brandy and tobacco. And it was only then that the smuggling trade turned from an export trade to an import trade. And suddenly all those smuggled goods, such as brandy and lace and tobacco, were being smuggled across the English Channel into this country. Okay, and it was only then that the profit margins in smuggling went completely through the roof. Okay, back in those days, you could um, buy a pound of tea for four pence on the continent and sell it for 25 pence um, here in England. So smuggling gang leaders were making huge, huge amounts of money. It was around this time around 1740 that huge gangs got involved in the smuggling trade. The most notorious of all these gangs was known as the Hawkehurst Gang. Um, their territory um, was Sussex and virtually the whole of Kent. They would roam the Kent countryside in serious numbers, hundreds strong. Of course, customs and excise officers existed back then, but of course, they didn't make the revenue that smugglers made. So smuggling gangs um, simply put a hundred men with cudgels lining up the seafront for when a boat came in. And even if the customs and excise men caught the smugglers red-handed, there was very little they could do because they were completely outnumbered. Of course, with the money involved in smuggling, it was very easy for smuggling gangs simply to pri bribe customs and excise officers. During the 18th century, um, violent incidents began taking place um, all up and down the coastline. For example, in 1769, a broadstairs smuggler named Joss Snelling, he was unloading a vessel of its smuggled goods on a Thanet beach when he was set upon by a customs and excise officer and a number of soldiers. During the fight that followed, Ten smugglers were mortally wounded um, and eight were arrested. Joss Snelling himself escaped with four of his men. He was chased by the customs and excise officer who they promptly shot. And this wasn't a standalone incident. Um, incidents like this were taking place um, virtually on a daily basis. Um, a few years later, in 1780, customs and excise men managed to seize a huge haul of smuggled gin over in Whitstable. Um, they loaded the gin onto a cart and they were ferrying it outside of Whitstable. Um, just on the outskirts of Whitstable, there's a very steep hill called Borstal Hill. And they were making their way up Borstal Hill when suddenly out of nowhere, 53 men jumped out um, holding bats with their faces covered and they killed several of the customs and excise men and made off with the entire load. Of course, back in those days, we didn't have modern day forensics, we didn't have blood testing and DNA and fingerprints, so it was very easy to get away with crimes like that. So eventually, something needed to happen. Someone needed to make a stand against smugglers on the Kent coast of England. And that someone was the boy they sent to do a man's job um, William Pitt the Younger. Um, he took office as Prime Minister of this country when he was only 24 years old. Um, he did everything at a very young age. He was studying at Cambridge University when he was 14 years old. People um, described him as a mathematical genius. When he took office as Prime Minister, he was the youngest ever Prime Minister at 24, but he also took office as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, 
Many people mocked him. They said that nations would stand and stare at the country left to a schoolboy's care. But nobody realised how brilliant he was at finances, which was what we needed at the time. Because during the 18th century, England had spent so much money fighting wars overseas, mainly against the French, not only on the continent, but also over in India. And William Pitt's job as Chancellor of the Exchequer was to balance the nation's books. Now, he did this a number of different ways. Okay? Firstly, he was the first person to introduce paper money to this country. So effectively, what he did of everybody was take large sums of gold and give them paper in return, which is a fantastic idea. <laughs> he also introduced a number of taxes, okay, many of which you'll be familiar with. Um, to begin with, he introduced a temporary tax. He promised it would only last for 10 years, and he named it income tax. <laughs> Okay, over 200 years ago. Now, when he first introduced it, it's worth pointing out, in his defence, that it was only 1%. Okay? It's gone up quite considerably since. <laughs> um, he also introduced um, the window tax. And as crazy as that tax sounds, it actually made some sense at the time, because it was based on the idea that the richer you were, the bigger house you would have owned, okay, and the more windows you would have had. So by taxing people on the amount of windows they had, it was a very clever way of taxing the rich people. Of course, people have never liked paying taxes, so they simply filled in their windows with bricks, and it's believed to be the origin of the English expression daylight robbery. And you still see the effects to this day. Um, you often see houses with fake windows painted on. Because uh, back in those days, people couldn't afford to pay window tax. But they didn't want to look poor, okay? So they'd fill their windows in with bricks and then they'd paint um, a fake window on the outside. <laughs> now, William Pitt the Younger, um, he was obsessed with the threat Napoleon posed just across the channel um, in the late 18th century. He was very aware that the smuggling trade was threatening to bankrupt the economy in this country because this country was losing an absolute fortune in lost revenue. And he was also very interested in the smuggling trade because the smuggling trade here in Kent was putting money directly in the war coffers of his enemy over in France. Because, of course, lots of that money was going back through the merchants up to Napoleon. So William Pitt the Younger, in 1781, he raised an army of 100 soldiers on horseback and 900 infantrymen. Um, he promised Parliament he would retrieve £100,000 worth of smuggled goods in the town of Deal. Okay? And he left Parliament and started marching down towards Deal with his army. Now, the smuggling trade was huge business. Um, lots and lots of people were informed um, and making a lot of money from the smuggling trade. So a messenger arrived way before William Pitt's soldiers did in Deal and let everybody know that there was an army on its way to Deal. The smuggling gangs put all of their contraband onto boats and sent those boats out into the English Channel towards France. So in 1781, when Pitt arrived in the town, he only managed to retrieve roughly one-tenth of what he'd promised Parliament. He left the town of Deal with £10,000 worth of smuggled goods. Of course, in 1781, £10,000 was a huge amount of money, so that smuggled contraband probably filled this room, but it was nothing in comparison to what he'd originally promised. The soldiers, um, they smashed a number of windows simply by throwing stones through the windows in, in the shops of Deal. Um, also, um, a local man who kicked up a fuss, was attacked by one of the soldiers, 
Um, he was hit with a mattock. However, he survived. So William Pitt eventually left the town in 1781, red-faced, um, but it wasn't over. He vowed to return, and he did just that. A few years later, in 1784, he again raised another army and set down to deal with a 1,000 soldiers. But this time, he decided to carry out completely different tactics. Um, instead of searching the town high and low for contraband, he ordered his soldiers just to march along the beach and they poured oil over all of the seaworthy vessels and then they lit them in front of the entire town. Of course, back in those days in Deal, if you were not a smuggler, and a lot of people were smugglers, you were a fisherman. So in that one swooping move, he destroyed virtually all of the town's livelihood. Now, smuggling gangs earn immense fortunes. So within weeks, they'd purchased new vessels and were continuing their smuggling operations. But it was the poor fishermen that really, really struggled for years to come. A few years after this incident, of course, William Pitt the Younger was made Lord Warden of the Sink Ports. <laughs> and of course... Because he was virtually bankrupt himself, as William Pitt the Younger was brilliant at dealing with the country's finances, he was terrible at dealing with his own finances. Okay? When his first tenure as Prime Minister ended, he was forced to sell his country house to pay off his gambling debts. Um, and as a result, he moved in to Warmer Castle and he lived there permanently. Very few Lord Wards of St Ports have ever done that. William Pitt the Younger did that, and it was only a few miles away from the town of Deal where everybody absolutely hated him. <laughs> so, of course, I mean, 1784, smuggling wasn't wiped out in Deal. Um, it continued for many, many years. To give you an example of how much money was involved in smuggling, I'll tell you the story of a smuggling gang. Um, they operated out of a farm called Parsonage Farm in Seasalter near Whitstable. Now, Whitstable smugglers, they were very, very lucky for a number of different reasons. Firstly, the oyster trade um, had supplied them with smuggling route, routes. They could very easily put their contraband onto oyster boats that were sailing straight along the Thames estuary into the city and all that merchandise would come out of the holes of those oyster boats and would be straight in the markets. Those oyster boats would also cross the channel into France, so they were very, very well positioned um, within the smuggling trade. So a gang operating out of a farm called Parsonage Farm in Seasalter, they established a very, very efficient way of communicating. During the daytime, they would stick brooms up certain chimneys from house to house to relay a message that customs and excise men were on their way. During the evening, they would light candles in particular windows of certain farms or houses to, again, convey that message. They say their system of communication was so efficient that if customs and excise men left the city of Canterbury, the smuggling gang could relay a message to the coastline in Whitstable before that customs and excise officers had reached the outskirts of the city of Canterbury. It was that efficient. Now, in 1812, when a member of this sea salter smuggling gang passed away, he left 1.1 million okay, to his children. On paper, he was a cow herder. <laughs> Now, 1.1 million, okay, in 1812, in today's money, is over 200 million pounds. It makes you think, doesn't it? It really does. Now, I've done lots and lots of research into smuggling over the years. Um, the one thing that is very unique about Whitstable smugglers is that during the Napoleonic Wars, there were so many French prisoners of war in this area <clears throat> that boats were set up along the Thames estuary. Um, they were called like, prison hulks, and they would accommodate French prisoners of war in absolutely terrible conditions. Often, the French prisoners of war, they would escape and they would jump over the side of the boat, 
and they would swim and eventually reach shore. Whitstable smugglers began trading French prisoners of war for contraband. So they would load up their smuggling vessels with French prisoners of war that had escaped. And then they would sail those French prisoners of war across to France and they would trade contraband. And that's, I've only ever come across that in Whitstable. Now, William Pitt had tried to wipe out smuggling and he'd failed. So eventually, somebody came up with a very, very different idea um, called the Coastal Blockade Force. Now, the Coastal Blockade Force originally was set up between the North Foreland and the South Foreland, okay? And it monitored simply that section of coastline for smuggling vessels. And it was very, very successful initially. So they continued it from the North Foreland all the way to the Isle of Sheppey, and then from the South Foreland all the way to Chichester. And it was so successful that in 1831, the Coastal Blockade Force handed over to what we now think of as the modern-day Coast Guard. Now, in 1845, the modern-day Coast Guard, they promised that smuggling was no more in this area. But when you think about the huge sums of money in the smuggling trade, it's very, very likely that those people had just been bribed and paid off, <laughs> and smuggling was still rife. Now, another form of smuggling that's very relevant to all the people in this room, because you obviously, you're all from Deal, and like me and my colleague Pete here, you're from the north end of Deal. Um, we had a very unique um, smuggling operation in the town of Deal. Um, as you're all aware, Four miles off of the coastline of Deal, we have the notorious Goodwin Sands, the, the infamous ship swallower. Now, the Goodwin Sands fascinate me. When I was a little boy, I visited them um, with a metal detector on the hovercraft, and it was beeping, and me and my uh, older brother were digging, and the captain of the hovercraft got off, and he informed me that if I didn't get on, the, boat, the hovercraft was leaving, and they would leave me there. So unfortunately, I didn't find the 150 million pounds of gold and silver that people believe is still out there. But the Goodwin Sands, they create a stretch of water known as the Downs Anchorage. Um, the Downs Anchorage is the very reason why Sandown, Deal and Warmer Castle were built in the first place. If the Goodwin Sands didn't exist, we wouldn't have castles along our coastline. The castles were built to protect the Downs Anchorage because the Downs Anchorage is a very large section of sheltered water. It's large enough to accommodate roughly 1,500 ships. So, of course, um, Caesar landed his forces, his Roman army, on the beach just in warmer. Now, in Henry VIII's time, Henry VIII was experiencing problems with France and with Spain, who were both threatening to invade together. So he was forced to build seven different forts along a two and a half mile stretch of coastline to protect the Downs Anchorage. So that if an invasion force pulled into the Downs Anchorage, like the Spanish Armada, for example, our castles could fire at them and sink all of those enemy ships. Henry VIII knew that in the 16th century, if the Spanish landed an army on the beach in Deal, that army would march to the city of Canterbury within a day and they would occupy the walled city of Canterbury. Um, and Henry VIII's forces would then face a very serious problem of evicting them from the city of Canterbury. That's the reason why he built the castles. However, the Downs Anchorage offer a very, very safe stretch of water for merchant ships to drop anchor. So Deal was a very, very lively place 200 years ago, largely because so many different merchant ships, largely East India Trading Company merchant ships, were sailing from India all the way round. They were dropping anchor in the Downs Anchorage. Okay, They were waiting for favourable wind to turn around and go around the North Foreland into the Thames Estuary so they could enter the city of London. <coughs> 
But of course, they dropped anchor. These sailors had been at sea for months and months and months. Um, so Deal was an exciting place. Lots of pubs, lots of rum, lots of uh, ladies of the night, shall we say. <laughs> now, of course, these merchant ships, they were loaded up with cargo. Lots of this cargo would find its way off of those ships um, into small boats that would be rowed straight up to our beach. Okay, People from Deal would row out to those boats and they would do deals with men from the East India Trading Company and then they would smuggle merchandise from those boats into the town of Deal and sell it on the black market. And that was something that was very, very common in this area as well. Um, now, I hope you've enjoyed my um, talk on smuggling. Um, I'd like to give anybody the opportunity to ask any questions.